Hi everyone, this is Professor Opterbeck. I'm really looking forward to the start of our constitutional law semester in just a few weeks. I'm making this video to give you a little bit of background on the history of the concept of constitutionalism and the rule of law. I think it's important for you, for us, to talk about some of this background, particularly in the times in which we live. It feels often like the very idea of the rule of law and of, of constitutional governance is, is under threat. And at the very least, the notions of what constitutional governance means is contested, as they always have been. So this video is not going to be on the final exam. Uh, I may ask some quiz questions about it in your first quiz, but it's primarily for your edification for background on some of the things that we'll be talking about during the semester. So this video is not going to be comprehensive. You will see as I start going through some of this history and background, there are just large amounts of things that we're going to have to blow by very quickly. And if uh, you are a historian or, or a, a student of history, you'll notice different things that I'm going by way too quickly. And that's just the nature of this sort of format. We want to do this in a, in a way that's manageable. But I hope I can touch on some themes that at least I think are important. And then at the end, we'll circle back and, and we'll talk about some things that maybe are missing from the discussion. But I want to go initially all the way back to the ancient Near East, which is really the beginnings of human civilization as such. Of course, the human species has been on the earth for, for millions of years, and, and uh, the modern human species, our human species, has, has been on the earth probably for hundreds of thousands of years. But the civilization that we're familiar with in, in kind of organized ways and using language and using uh, symbolic things in the context of the history of life on earth is really, really recent. And probably maybe in the past 50,000 years or so that human beings really had the kinds of capacities for writing and language that we have now. And really only in the past three or 4,000 years that we've had the beginnings of cities. And so with the beginnings of cities and the beginnings of writing, we see the beginnings of the first human law codes, at least the first written human law codes. And this is one of the things that I want you to consider and think about a little bit. Our concept of positive law, positive law is human-made law, our concept of the rule of law, and our concept of constitutional governance relates to the idea that there's some kind of public record of what the law is that's accessible to everyone, that everyone can at least theoretically understand, but that at least is publicly available. And so we see this in the ancient Near East. The first written law code that we're aware of is that of Ur-Namu, who is the uh, chieftain or king of the city of Ur in the ancient Near East. And you know, notice a, a, an interesting theme in his law code. Part of what it's about, at least uh, to the extent it's not just propaganda, is Ur-Namu protecting the weak or establishing the law to protect the weak as well as establishing law to facilitate commerce and to facilitate the way the society is going to operate. You might be more familiar with the Code of Hammurabi, which a lot of us learn about at least a little bit in, in high school. Uh, and the, the picture on the screen is a stella of the cuneiform of the Code of Hammurabi, uh, which is in the Louvre. Uh, and so the Code of Hammurabi uh, is interpreted in different ways. It may be a set of statutes, and, and if you read, you know, kind of in translation some aspects of the code, you'll see it deals with a lot of different things, like protecting the poor, like the way commerce should be done, like remedies for injuries, kinds of things we, we would be familiar with today. Um, so it could be a set of statutes. Some scholars think it's actually a record of kind of judicial decisions or arbitration type decisions, or some scholars think it's actually um, more a set of principles that are meant to be illustrative. But a thing to notice is it's, in a sense, published. It's, it's put on a stella like this, and it's, it's put up in some public place so uh, people can have access to it. 
So the next one I want to touch on is the Hebrew tradition or the Jewish tradition, which we can find in the Bible and in the Jewish tradition in the Torah. So you're probably familiar in one way or another, at least with the concept of the Ten Commandments, uh, which according to the Torah, God gave to Moses as kind of the basic principles, things like don't uh, lie, don't steal, don't commit murder, uh, that are, are the basis for the society. And then you might be a little less familiar, unless you've studied this, with very detailed laws throughout the Torah, um, especially in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, about the structure of society, uh, about economic laws, including uh, laws similar to those of Ur-Nammu uh, and, and Hammurabi for protecting the poor, uh, and then of religious law. And then one of the things that I want you to be thinking about as you're watching this video, and even as we go through the course this semester, these ancient sources of law all assume a universe in which there are gods or a god and relate their legal codes to that belief in the gods or in a god and set up their societies in a way that are, are designed in some way to relate to the gods or a god. Uh, now in the modern period in which we live and in particularly in liberal democracies, and by liberal here I don't mean our politically liberal versus conservative, I mean classical liberalism, uh, that is constitutional governance of the, of the kind we're aware of, we value uh, freedom of religion and we value, at least in the United States, the government not having an established religion, but that's a relatively recent development. And so one thing we'll think about is how law, if at all, relates to uh, religion. Now a few principles you can pull out of the Hebrew law out of the Torah. Sedek is the idea of justice or righteousness. Mishpat is the idea of making judgments, of looking at, at specific cases and being able to make wise judgments. Shalom, a word you probably heard, is, is the idea of peace. And chesed is the, word, is the concept of loving kindness. And if you look at the Torah, you can see these themes of Sedek, Mishpat, Shalom, Hesed, as the values, or at least the ideals, that are supposed to form the society. So you wouldn't call, I don't think, the Torah certainly a constitution, certainly not in, in any modern sense, but it is a detailed set of published law with principles that underlie the published law. The next step I want to make then is to talk about ancient Greek. And again, probably from, you know, a course in civics or something like that that you might have had or, or Western civilization, you've talked about some of these ideas and you know that the general idea of democracy um, kind of initially bubbles up in, in Greek thought. Um, and maybe you've studied a little bit more if you've studied political philosophy of Plato and Aristotle. And we're going to talk about them just a little bit. So I want to talk about Plato first. So for Plato, the realm of ideas is actually more real than the material world. It's not that the material physical world isn't real, but it's that the, there's an ideal world, what, what he called the world of the forms, which, to which the physical world in some way relates and, and drives its uh, existence. So the world of ideas is more, more real. The governance of a city or a polis, and you know, if you think about a word like metropolis, right? polis is the Greek word for a city, like anything else in Plato's view, could be, could be compared to the ideal form through the exercise of reason. So this, this idea of the realm of ideas, the ideal realm, is of course you know, metaphysical speculation or, or reasoning of Plato, but it also serves a purpose because it gives a concept of excellence. And you compare the thing that exists in the material world to the ideal form. And what you want to do is to try and get the thing in the material world, if you can, as close to that ideal form as you can. So an idea of excellence that kind of exceeds the physical thing that exists. And you do that through reason. And for Plato, the capacity to reason relates to the quality of a person's soul. Now, when Plato uses a term like soul, he's not thinking of it 
in a way that you might think of it in a modern sense if you haven't sort of really studied or thought about the concept. And you're probably you would probably derive your concept actually more from Rene Descartes, who's a uh, a modern figure. And you know, for Descartes, for the modern idea, there's kind of like the body, and then the soul is uh, somehow this kind of separate entity that may or may not relate to the body. Um, and that's not how Plato would have thought of it. Now, Plato did think of, of the soul as a, a part of a person's being, but uh, the soul relates closely to the body. But for Plato, um, the person's soul relates also to this realm of the forms, this ideal realm. And so a person's soul, and really meaning the quality of that person, the qualities of that person, their reasoning, their moral qualities, can be more or less excellent, more or less ideal. Um, now Plato had some elaborate ideas about this, and ultimately what he th thought was a properly disciplined person, that is a person through, through reason, through um, uh, a certain kinds of ascetic practices, through other kinds of practices, um, is disciplining their mind and themselves, remembers what the ideal is more like. And for Plato, the people who were best able to do that were philosophers. Now, of course, Plato uh, thought of himself as a philosopher. And so, you know, this is sort of a category of people that um, Plato is putting himself into. But philosophers, he thought, possessed this kind of discipline. And therefore, ideally, the ideal city would be ruled by a philosopher king who can create good laws. So you shouldn't think of Plato as uh, sort of a democratic kind of thinker, Plato has the ideal of a philosopher king. Um, and as we look at the history of constitutional thought and the rule of law, there's going to be this tension. And even today, there's going to be a bit of tension between expertise, understanding, capacity, preparedness, however you would define those things, to govern, and the relation of that to the entire uh, population, the entire polis, the entire you know, country or commonwealth, um, and those who might not be yet quite as prepared to govern, and what that means and, and how those relate to each other. And we'll particularly see the question of kingship and tyranny and democracy. Now, the next Greek thinker I want to briefly talk about is Aristotle. Now, if you've studied this, again, if you've studied political philosophy or philosophy or, or maybe history, you'll know Plato and Aristotle are two of the great Greek thinkers. Uh, there's interesting ways in which their thought relates to each other, and then interesting ways in which Aristotle's thought difference, differs from Plato's. You'll also know that there are other important schools of Greek thought, the Sto Stoics, the Epicureans. We don't have time to cover all of those. I'm trying to just do a few highlights here. So we'll talk about Aristotle. And uh, there's a lot, obviously, we could, we could spend a whole semester talking about these two figures. But the things I want to highlight here, Aristotle looks at three forms of, of governance that, that he's familiar with. Kingship, uh, so a single king. Aristocracy, governance by a, a, a small member of elites. And what he called constitutional government governance. So we get this kind of... Uh, concept of, of constitutional governance from Aristotle. Now, it doesn't mean that Aristotle has the same uh, concept of a constitution as we do, um, but there is a notion of contrasting in Aristotle kingship and governance by a small aristocracy with governance in a society in which various segments of society have some kind of say that is balanced in some kind of legal structure. And that is a core part of what we mean by constitutional governance. We have different parts or pieces or members of society. Uh, it's not only a small few or one that has a say in how things are governed, um, but the way in which the different parts or members of society have a say is arranged by some kind of compact or, or legal rule or, or agreement. Now, in the possible forms of government for Aristotle, there were ways in which a society could get away from 
the, the right ends or goals or good goals of excellence and flourishing of a society. So for kingship, Aristotle said, you could have tyranny, and that's a deviation. You know, in his mind, there's a good kind of kingship that is not tyranny. You could have aristocracy, which could be good, but you could have oligarchy, which is ruled by a, a few people who are corrupt. You could have constitutional government governance, and for Aristotle, the contrast to that is democracy. And by democracy, what he meant is that each individual constituent gets an equal voice. He did not conceive of constitutional government as each citizen or each person or each constituency getting an equal voice. So those are some things to, some tensions to think about. And when we're, when we're considering constitutional governance, this uh, tension between uh, the, the way a constitutional system gives all of the parts of society a voice, but structures that in a way that it isn't just mob rule. And what Aristotle, Aristotle was afraid of in democracy is mob rule. Um, so, so how do you do that, and yet uh, do that in a way that doesn't exclude people? And what is the relationship between democracy and a constitutional republic? Those are some really in interesting questions. Now I'll just mention here, we're gonna come back to it at the end, but you know, in, Aristotle, in both Plato's and Aristotle's views of governance, um, they accepted slavery uh, and slaves didn't have rights. Uh, women didn't, didn't have rights. Um, a, people of certain classes of society wouldn't have rights. So in, in no sense is either Plato's or Aristotle's concept by modern standards, egalitarian, and in, in many ways it's deeply problematic, but there are important ideas that we could say filter into some of our modern concepts. So we have just now blown through you know, all of ancient Greece very inadequately, but just highlighting a few things, and now let's talk about Roman. So why are we talking about Rome? You know, We think of the Roman Empire as uh, this you know, soldiers marching and Caesar marching and things like that and all of that, of course, at various times in Roman history is true. Um, but we're trying to give some introduction to American con concepts of constitutional governance and the rule of law since we will be studying American constitutional law this semester. And if we do that, we, you know, kind of trace our ideas about law in, in America. And we're going to look at England in fact, we can consider it Anglo-American concepts in many ways. So we'll look at England, that's vitally important, and you'll see we sp we'll spend a bit of time doing that. Um, but England is part of what we can call Christendom, which is part of medieval Europe and, and classical Europe, all of which rises out of the ashes of the Roman Empire and adopts particularly in its concepts of law, things from the Roman Empire. So, uh, and, and the Roman Empire, of course, adopts at least some ideas from Greece. So this continuity actually is, is really important. And one of the things I want to try to communicate in this video, and that I hope you get a feel for through it, is that these ideas that we're debating uh, these concepts that, that we're studying have really, really deep roots for some really important reasons. And uh, there are things, of course, that we're, we're, we're going to um, modify. There's things we might even jettison, obviously, like the concept of, of slavery from, from the Greek heritage. Um, but there may be things, I think there are things, that we want to retain if we really want to retain a sense of uh, the society that we think we are and that we think we want to build. And so that's one of the reasons to, to kind of go back into this history. All right, so let's talk about, about Rome. The uh, early history of Rome is called the Roman Republic. And it was a republican form of government, government meaning that there were different parts of society that had different kinds of political rights. It was not an absolute monarchy in the Republican era of Rome. Now there was a, uh, an aristocracy and there were 
rulers of Rome. And one of the legal fictions that facilitated that was something called the Lex Regia. So the Lex Regia was the idea that there was an ancient document through which the citizens of Rome transferred to the emperor the authority to rule as emperor. Now, again, in the Republican period, the Senate uh, were, you know, was still was very important. It wasn't a um, kind of st uh, strict one-person kind of rule. But the idea was that the people transferred whatever authority the emperor had to the emperor. So there is a deep notion of consent. And that's what I want you to really pull out of, pull out of this. This idea of consent, this idea that the people, even in um, Roman era, when you know, it's, it's, uh, there, there is a ruler with a great, an individual ruler with a great degree of power, um, that power comes from the consent of the people. Now, to be fair, and I say it's a fiction, uh, this idea of the Lex Regia exists through the Republic and it is, um, also exists in the Augustinian period. So if you, you know your Roman history, you know, kind of later in the history of Rome, you have uh, the Caesars, the rulers of Rome, claiming for themselves a more absolute kind of power than they would have had during the Republic and even claiming to be divine. Uh, and even then, they looked to the fiction of the Lex Regia and said, the, and the emperor said, I'm not just, you know, kind of taking this arbitrarily, but the people have given this power. And so there is, of course, a propaganda kind of purpose to something like this. But nevertheless, it's a concept that in Roman jurisprudence remains important. Another thing from the, re the Republican period of Rome that we want to mention is the Twelve Tables. So the Twelve Tables were a set of rules or principles that uh, were written down and, and published for anyone uh, to see about basic principles of Roman law that were applicable to Roman citizens and others in the Republic. And they included rules for civil procedure, Rules for paternal power, the male head of a household. Again, this was not an egalitarian society. Um, rules on inheritance, guardianship, ownership of possession, so property and real property rules. Uh, rules on compensation for injuries, so torts. Public law, the way certain uh, existing public institutions were to function. And sacred law, again, uh, no concept here of the formal disestablishment of religion from the state. They're closely hand in hand. So you wouldn't consider the Twelve Tables a constitution. You wouldn't consider them a Bill of Rights. But the idea of a published Bill of Rights can be traced, at least in part, to the Twelve Tables. And the idea of a constitution as a publicly accessible charter that lays out basic rules, particularly for, for public law, is also something that has some roots in the Twelve Tables. So one of the great jurisprudes in Roman history is Cicero. And I just want to give you a few things from Cicero that, uh, and there's you know, much, much, much you could read, of course, in Cicero, and maybe if you've, if you've studied this, this stuff you have. Um, and again, we wouldn't in modern times agree with everything Cicero said, but some concepts, some ideas um, that I think are kind of important in our legal tradition and that are, are, are the American founders certainly thought were important. So the connection between right reason and law, human reason and law. And this is, has resonance with Aristotle's idea of law as, as teleological and with Plato's idea of um, law and re human reason participating in the ideal form of things. And this is an idea of natural law. Now, I am a kind of natural law theorist, and I will um, do a separate introductory video of myself a little bit for you and talk about some of that background of my own. 
That is not a common position in the legal academy today. There are some important schools of it in the legal academy. Uh, and, but it's not a common position. And in Western jurisprudence today, American uh, and continental European jur jurisprudence, it's really not a common position. Uh, and maybe it wouldn't be your position, and that's OK. That's something we, we can discuss. Um, but one way or the other, the, I would suggest there has to be some connection between law and reason. And, and reason has to mean something. It can't be something merely arbitrary all the way down, I, I would argue at least. There are some people who would argue the opposite. Um, but there's a deep history of the idea that law has a connection to reason and that reason really means something, that it, that it points at, at something beyond itself. All right, justice is one, it binds all of human society. So the, con the connection between law and reason, the connection between law, reason, and justice. And this also suggests that justice means something, that justice has a dimension that goes beyond just any particular you know, individual human society in any particular time or place. Uh, now again, you might not uh, agree with that. You might think justice is entirely contingent. It's kind of a word we use for different ways in which we construct our relationships, and that's an important kind of, there are many different modern schools of thought which would take that approach. Um, I personally don't take that approach, but maybe you do. We can have that discussion, but it's something we need to consider. The idea of the republic as the property of the public, res publica, res publici. Um, so the republic doesn't belong to the emperor or the king. The republic doesn't belong to the senate. The republic doesn't belong to any one person. The republic belongs to the entire public. Of course, Cicero's idea of who constituted the public would have been certain free men. Not everybody. But the idea of the republic as everyone's property, in a sense, and everyone's responsibility is important. A true republic, and so, so Cicero you know, thinks of there are different kinds of republics, but, but what is a republic really supposed to be? And he just finds it as a numerous gathering brought together by legal consent and a community of interest. And so I want you to notice again two th threads here. That thread of consent that I mentioned earlier, and then this additional thread of community of interest. So a republic for Cicero is not just any old agreement between people, but it's an agreement in where, where they have a community in which they have some kinds of common interests, or maybe we could say better common values that they hold together. Now, Cicero thought the best form of government would be based in a mixed constitution. Uh, and he's playing here off of Aristotle's different possible forms of government. And he thought balancing a role for the aristocracy, a role for the monarchy, and a role for democracy, meaning a role for the common people. Now, you might notice here kind of early stirrings of a concept of separation of powers. This is not a formal concept of separation of powers in Cicero, but the notion that there is some more aristocratic part of the government that kind of puts a break on the possibility of mob rule by the more common part of the government and a head of the government who has some personal responsibility you, you can see already um, the idea of possibly you know, a, a higher house in the legislature, a lower house, and, and an executive. So now I want to briefly touch on a couple of other important figures. And we're going to cover in these next couple of slides a span of about eight or nine centuries. So again, we're, we're eliding and going past a lot of really important things. I'm just trying to draw out a, a few themes in a relatively brief video for you. Uh, and I'm going to talk about Augustine and Aquinas. Now, you might know these are figures from uh, 
uh, Christian church history. Augustine is one of the great church fathers. Aquinas is a medieval monk and very important theologian in Christian traditions. And in drawing this out, I'm not meaning to suggest that other religious traditions are not important. Of course, we looked briefly at, very briefly, at the Jewish traditions in, in the Torah. Um, we could spend some really interesting time talking about Islamic traditions, uh, but in this video, I'm trying to really focus on the developments that lead to our American idea of constitutionalism. And I think these thinkers inform some of the thinking that then kind of filters into our system. And, and they have some important ideas. Again, they have some ideas that we wouldn't uh, go with today and that we'd find really problematic, but they have some important ones. So for Augustine, I want you to notice this first quote that I pull out. And you will notice, I think, that it follows on Cicero's idea of what a commonwealth is. And in fact, in this portion of Augustine's famous text, the city of God, he is playing off, specifically playing off of Cicero's idea. Um, so notice where Cicero said a community of interest. Augustine says a people or a commonwealth is a gathered multitude of rational beings, that idea of reason, united by agreeing, that idea of consent, to share the things they love. So uh, if you know Augustine's work at all, the, the idea of, of desire and love is really important to his work. And he's kind of putting a gloss on Cicero here in saying that the community of interest is a community of love. Now, you shouldn't think of this as kind of, um, you know, Hallmark holiday movie kind of fluffy emotions. Um, you know, this is a kind of love that is, that is passionate, but that is deep and committed. So the idea that a real republic, a good republic, there are, there are, passions in which people commit to each other. But another really important idea in Augustine that he in particular, I think, draws out is that the positive law and all of our political systems have important limits. Now, if you know this text, The City of God at all, you know what August Augustine's writing kind of at the twilight, at the end of the Roman Empire. Um, the, the political world is falling apart when Augustine is writing this. And he's writing as a bishop and a theologian and trying to sort of make sense of what's going on. And you know what he says is we have the, the earthly city in which we live and the heavenly city for which we are destined. And those two cities overlap, kind of, you know, kind of like a Venn diagram. And so there is some space where the heavenly city and the earthly city, we're already doing things in the earthly city that already share in the heavenly city, but they're not the same. And for him, the earthly city is passing away so that there's only so much you can expect the earthly city to accomplish. There's only so much you can expect the law to accomplish. In fact, you might be surprised to know that Augustine thought that the law probably should not ban prostitution. Of course, we have debates about, about all of that today for some of the same reasons, but for, for some different reasons. But he kind of thought it's a sort of law that's going to end up being unenforceable and not really a useful way to move people toward what he considered uh, to be other forms of, of behavior and marriage and so on. Um, so the notion that government governance might be limited uh, has, has deep roots in someone like Augustine. And I think you see those, those Augustinian ideas um, filtered through the Protestant Reformation and, and groups like the Puritans finding their way into some of the thought of at least some of the, the framers of the US Constitution and their notions of, of the limits of what government can be and what it can accomplish. Now you might not share Augustine's kind of eschatology, his view of the end of the world. Um, you might not be religious at all and that's fine. But one of the questions we have to ask is, you know, what is the role of, of, the, of the temporal government? And, and is a constitution kind of playing a limiting role so that other elements of society uh, can flourish? Is the, is, the, is the government playing a broader role? What's the end in, in view? So Aquinas, again, now we're jumping, you know, kind of into the later part of the medieval period. And 
Aquinas is uh, one of the really important scholastic thinkers. They're called scholastic because they were related to uh, the um, theological and liberal arts schools, the University of Paris for Aquinas. Um, Aquinas actually in his own time, or shortly after his own time, was, was disfavored, but he came, came back in, into favor later on in um, Catholic thinking. So Aquinas had, and he wrote quite a bit about law and governance. Uh, within his, his famous Summa Theologica, he wrote a whole treatise on law. And uh, he held to an Aristotelian, and if you know Aquinas at all, he's, he's taking um, Ar some of Aristotle's ideas. Aristotle had actually been kind of lost to thinkers in the West until some of his works were rediscovered by Islamic thinkers and then brought back uh, into thinkers in the West. So he's trying to play off some of those ideas. So he thinks the best form of government is kingship or an aristocracy. He's, he's certainly not a modern Democrat. But he does strongly emphasize in some places this idea of consent. And in fact, he kind of had a sort of um, mixed constitution idea in a sense of what the best governance is, because he saw a role for the people in choosing who the king is. And he saw the king as being accountable to the people. And like Aristotle, he thought if the king is not accountable to the people, that leads to tyranny. So a theme of consent. There are many other things we could say about Aquinas's ideas about the rule of law, but this is the main one for us now that I want you to remember. So as we talked about Cicero, the late Roman Republic, Augustine, Aquinas, we were mostly located in continental Europe and not in England. Now we're going to jump over to England. And there's a, obviously a lot of, of history about the development of England that we're just going to set aside for now. But because we are talking about the American legal tradition, we have to look at some developments in English history and law that feed directly into our American concepts of constitutional government. And we're going to start here in the 12th century. You have probably heard of the Magna Carta. Uh, maybe you've studied what it is, maybe you haven't, but we're going to talk a bit about some events leading up to Magna Carta and, and how we get there. So we have a period in the 12th century called the Anarchy of, of Stephen. And Briefly, Stephen is the king at this time. Um, there's constant disputes between the landed aristocracy and the monarchy. These, at various times, and we'll see this in, in the next number of slides, break out into hostilities. And at this point, government has really broken down. The rule of law has really broken down. And to some extent, this begins to change then with the rule of Henry II. And one of the ways that this begins to cha change is another theme that you certainly have heard about, um, you know, ad nauseum through your whole first year of law school, which is the common law. So you know from your first year of law school that the common law is law that is um, not first derived from statutes, from legislatures, but that is derived from judicial decisions. Disputes become before judges. The judges look at it based on some established principles. They make a decision, and then that becomes a precedent. And then there's another dispute that's kind of similar. They make some distinctions. They draw some analogies. And, and slowly, the rules of the common law develop. But where does that idea come from? It comes from Henry II. And in this period of anarchy, trying to create some consistency throughout the kingdom, uh, creates a court called the King's Bench. And the King's Bench is a court that meets throughout the country and develops decisions based on general principles that are supposed to be common to the whole realm of England. And this starts this system of the common law. So that theme that there's a source of law in decisions, in local contexts that creates principles that are, that are common to all comes from this period. 
So now we'll move to the reign of Richard I. And is not uncommon in these periods of history. There's a whole bunch of intrigue through which Richard takes the throne. He takes the throne and then he goes away on crusade. This is the era of the crusades. You may know him by his nickname, Richard the Lionheart, which is he nickname he took through the crusades. And when he is away, his brother John is ruling in his stead. And John is imposing heavy taxes and is abusing his office and is deeply unpopular. Now, you, you might be familiar with these characters, Richard the Lionheart, King John, the Sheriff of Nottingham, and Robin Hood. This is the era of the tales of, of Robin Hood. Um, and I have a degree actually from the University of Nottingham, which indeed is the place where Nottingham Forest is and where those tales came from. So Richard is away, John is imposing high taxes. By the way, you'll also see in, in um, our discussions of English history and constitutionalism, a theme of a ruler imposing high taxes where people feel, especially the elites, feel they don't have a say in what those taxes are and that leading to trouble. Um, so John is ruling in his stead. There are rival aristocratic rulers who are disputing these issues of taxation and other issues with John. Uh, there is a further dispute between Pope Innocent III and John, uh, England is still Catholic at this point, about the appointment of Stephen Langton as the Archbishop of Canterbury. So there are a whole bunch of disputes swirling around and it's uh, getting close to the point of civil war. And an agreement is brokered through Magna Carta. So a couple of important things to note in Magna Carta. There are things that resemble our Bill of Rights. Excessive penalties, the need for evidence to have a conviction, uh, impartial application of the rule of law. And there are also things that resemble our constitutional system. A council, a kind of parliament, that, is, that the king is going to have to be subject to and not stand alone as a kind of checks and balances, a parliament, of course, of uh, elites at this point. So you do have these uh, ideas, of early ideas of civil rights, early ideas of a kind of, of constitutional governance structure, and it's a, a famous document for many reasons. You might not know, historically, it actually didn't work. Uh, it ended up that King John didn't like the arrangement. Uh, Pope Innocent, you know, um, had, you know, Pope, uh, John, uh, King John submitted eventually to Pope Innocent. Some of the disputes between them went away. And eventually John got Pope Innocent to issue a, an anathema, a decree against Magna Carta. And so you can see that anathema on this screen. So in the short term, it didn't work. However, different version, versions of it were, were subsequently promulgated and the concept, the concept that there was this charter of liberties, that there were civil liberties for people and that there were um, in the fabric of the nation a, a constitutional relationship between crown and, and, and a kind of parliament endured. Now one place where you see that enduring is in Bracton. So Bracton is one of the uh, great English jurisprudence of the late Middle Ages. Now remember, we looked at, a, at Aquinas. You kind of have um, parallel or somewhat different developments in England. And, and, I, and I mentioned, you, know, you have this continental European tradition. You have this, this uh, Anglo tradition. They're not entirely separate, but they begin to go in some, some different directions. So a few things, there's lots of things, again, we could say about Bracton. Um, a few things we can say. He talks about the common law, um, and you know he says you could criticize, and particularly people in the continental European tradition could criticize English common law concept because you don't have detailed sets of statutes. Um, but he says 
the common law are still, are still rules, laws approved by the people. Um, and notice how he used the term res publica, right? The, the body of the people, the, the republic, um, is involved in this process, as is the king. Uh, and notice this concept, again, of consent. The authority, the, the principle of where the authority of the law comes from, for Bracton, certainly is an idea of natural law. But within that idea of natural law is the idea that the consent of the people matters for it to be real law within a republic. Uh, and, and so the rules can't be changed, according to Bracton, without some idea of consent. Now, this sounds you know, almost Republican or Democratic. Republican, I mean, in the sense of a republic. Um, we should note, though, and, and those arguments, those sort of Republican arguments of Bracton, are used, as we'll see in a moment, in later disputes. But Bracton also very strongly held up the role of, of the king. And so for Bracton, the king is not subject to any other man, but is subject only to God. So the king follows only after God. And a private person, according to Bracton, can't question the interpretation of the law made by a king. So there is this idea in Bracton that law comes from consent, uh, that the populace as a whole has some role in what the law is, but the interpretation of the law still resides with the king, and that's not something really that an ordinary person can question because that, according to Bracton, is an authority that comes from God. So to continue our discussion of the English background, we need to discuss the period from Henry VIII to James I. And you might be somewhat familiar with Henry and his six marriages. Henry was married to Catherine of Aragon and wanted to have that marriage annulled for a number of reasons, including that he was frustrated that he didn't have a male heir. Henry was carrying on an affair at that time with Mary Boleyn and wanted to actually marry Mary's sister, Anne Boleyn. Henry got into a dispute with the papacy about the ability to have this marriage annulled. At this time, England was still a Catholic country. And the upshot of that dispute was that the English crown, Henry, was declared to be sovereign over papal authority. And the English church, the Anglican church, split away from the Roman Catholic church. And England then became a Protestant country. So Henry's daughter, Mary, Queen of Scots, you may know her as Bloody Mary, inherited the throne from Henry and violently reinstated Catholicism in England. And that's how she got the sobriquet Bloody Mary. Henry's daughter, Elizabeth, Elizabeth I, who was a Protestant, took the throne after Mary. Elizabeth died without an heir. She was known as the Virgin Queen. And her cousin, James, James I, took the throne after Elizabeth. The one thing you can begin to see in these periods of English history that we're going to be talking about is the significant tension that often breaks out into violence between the sympathizers of Roman Catholicism in England and the sympathizers of the Anglican form of Protestantism in England. And we will also see in a moment a, another form of Protestantism in England called Puritanism, and that being a dispute with the Anglican faction. So these underlying religious disputes, which are also uh, cultural identity kind of disputes, which then tie into sort of geopolitical disputes in Europe at the time, are significant in this period of, hi of history. So one of the things that James I did that is very relevant to our discussion is to expand the use of royal prerogatives over the common law courts. Remember how we discussed that the com development of the common law in England was a very important development in mitigating the anarchy of Stephen, a way of finding a principles of law that could be common throughout the realm, but that still could be applied locally by judges hearing cases. Now, there always had been the possibility of prerogative courts uh, where the 
king hears certain kinds of claims. But James ex expanded this. And that allows James, as the king, to have more control over these courts, more control over the law that these courts are applied, and more control over the judgments that these courts are issuing. And James also had tensions with Parliament. And we're going to see another theme. I mentioned the theme of these religious social tens tensions between Catholics, Protestant Anglicans, and Protestant Puritans. And we will also see the tension between the authority of the crown and the authority of Parliament. And Parliament is, of course, the elected body of legislators comprised of a House of Lords and a House of Commons. One of the courts that James the one James the first utilized is something you also may have heard of called the Star Chamber. And the, the picture we have uh, here with this slide is a picture of what the Star Chamber looked like. So the Star Chamber was a uh, specialized prerogative court which did not include any due process kinds of protections for the accused, whose judgments were often rendered in secret, and that sometimes employed torture. So if you hear the expression today, uh, you know, that process is just a star chamber. It's referring to the idea that it's, uh, it's secretive and, not, and, and maybe not on the up and up. There were also, and so these uh, expansion of the prerogatives, use of courts like the star chamber, uh, trying to do away with parliament, created political problems in the realm for James, and in particular created problems with the nobility, with the lords who wanted some ability to govern their own affairs. There also were further religious cultural disputes because James wanted to marry his son Charles to a Catholic Spanish princess. This surfaced again that tension between Roman Catholicism and Anglican Protestantism and it also surfaced ongoing tensions between England and Spain and, in fact, led to war with Spain. Now, again, we're, we're going by so much history that we aren't going to have time to cover, but I want to highlight a little bit of this background so you get a feel for where the constitutional disputes and crises come from. And so these efforts by James to consolidate his power and the disputes James is having with the other nobility and with Parliament lead James in 1610 to give a speech to Parliament justifying his position. And this speech is considered a historically important document for these discussions of constitutionalism. And of course, what James is doing in this speech is trying to justify his position about monarchy. So notice how he's talking about the notion that the authority of the sovereign comes from directly from, from God. And just as God, James says, has the ability to uh, rule over his subjects and to dispose of his subjects, in other words, to render judgments on his subjects and to decide what they receive and what they don't receive, the king has the same right. The King Henry sen says is lex loquens, the law speaking. And so that's a powerful statement Remember how we talked about this, this tradition, even from the ancient Near East, of law being publicly accessible, of governing everyone. And James, in some ways, is asserting this royal prerogative and saying that actually the king is the law speaking. So these are strong assertions of the authority of the king. But notice James, even James, says that the king must observe the law. There is a sense in which the king is also subject to the law, and if the king is not subject to the law, the king can devolve into a tyrant. Now, of course, that was begging the question of the actual dispute king was having, uh, James was having with the nobility. James claimed that he was acting in accordance with the broad principles of the law, and in particular with the broad principle of the authority of the king, and the nobility was claiming that he was ignoring important broad principles, including consent and the development of the common law. And for James, he said it is sedition for a subject to dispute what a king may do. Notice then all of the themes from Bracton, both the themes of consent and of the sovereignty of the people and the subjectness of the king to the rule of law and the authority of the king, 
come forth in different ways in James' speech. Now, in response to James, Sir Edward Cook, who was a prominent common lawyer, published what he called the Prohibitions del Rey, in other words, the Prohibitions on the King. And this dispute between James and Cook is regarded as an important moment in developing our, our, the frameworks of our current concepts of constitutional government, and certainly something that the framers of the U.S. Constitution um, were well aware of. And so Cook doesn't deny the, the legitimacy of kingship, but Cook says the king can't personally adjudge a case. The king, through prerogative courts or otherwise or in his own person, shouldn't be the final judge of, of justice. The final judge of justice has to be done according to the long-standing custom of England. And the long-standing custom of England really here, uh, because there wasn't a written constitution, stands in for constitutional principles. And among those principles is that there should be neutral courts who are not the king himself who are deciding cases. So notice here both the idea that there is a rule of law that governs the sovereign and that there are principles that the rule of law relates to and that there's some kind of separation of powers is present. Cook cites Bracton, the parts of Bracton, of course, that would be favorable to him, and cites Magna Carta. So we can see how this um, symbol of Magna Carta is important as a symbol of, of some kind of rule of law and constitutional government. Now, the upshot of this dispute is that James had Cook removed as a judge, and James was able to affirm, in doing that, his royal supremacy. But the ideas of the dispute lived on and still live on. And the ideas and the issues that were behind this dispute, in fact, ended up spilling over into, into violence, into periods in England when there was revolution and civil war. And those periods are also important for our discussion because they continue to relate to how these principles we're talking about develop. James' son, Charles, had, a, had Catholic sympathies and he opposed the Puritans in the Church of England. I'm sure you've heard the term Puritans and you can imagine in, in your mind um, a Thanksgiving celebration with the people in their big black hats and their white stockings and, and belt buckles. And you probably know that they came over on, on the Mayflower. And we'll talk about all of that in a moment. Uh, if you haven't studied it, you might not have a sense of who the Puritans really were and where they fit in the religious landscape of England at the time. And as I mentioned, England had been a Catholic country. In Henry VIII's time, England asserted the, the uh, primacy of the king to determine the religious landscape of the nation. It became a Protestant country and the Church of England, the Anglican Church, became independent from the Roman Catholic Church. There were still, as we have noted, many Roman Catholic sympathizers in England and the Anglican Church of the time in many ways was actually closer to Catholicism than to other forms of Protestantism like Calvinism or Lutheranism, both in its beliefs and in its actual practices. And uh, if you're familiar with any of this landscape at all today, if you go to uh, certain kinds of Anglican churches even today, for example, St. Thomas Church on, on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan, um, it would feel very much like a Roman Catholic service to you, both in its, its formality and its rituals and so on. So this party of Anglicans, uh, Anglicans at the time of Charles I it, are, are kind of close to Catholics in some ways, although different in others. The Puritan party is a more staunchly Calvinist group, and among other things, they want to strip away what they see as some of the extra finery and excess of the Anglican Church. In effect, the Puritans want to purify, that's why they're called Puritans, uh, 
the Anglican Church because they think it's still too Catholic. Um, and it includes certain political views and, and uh, certain ways of living as well. Uh, so there are tensions between these parties and Charles I being a Catholic sympathizer opposes the Puritans politically and religiously. And this, this creates a tension obviously with the Puritan party and James raises taxes and you see again this familiar, other familiar theme with the effort of the king to raise taxes and at the same time to assert the kingly authority to raise and enforce the taxes sometimes without the, path, uh, without the support of parliament. And here parliament, a significant portion of parliament was, was made up by Puritan members and others were Anglican members. Parliament passes resolutions against some of Charles's policies and Charles in response dissolves parliament and imprisons some of the members of parliament without charge. A familiar struggle that we are seeing throughout the history of England and one that is significant for our discussions of the rule of law and constitutionalism. So from this period there's an important judicial decision called the Five Knights case decided in 1627 and this arises from a writ of habeas corpus filed on behalf of some of the people Charles had arrested. Now if you don't know what habeas corpus is we're actually going to look at the habeas corpus and suspension clause in constitutional law uh, later in the semester, but habeas corpus basically means have the body, and it's one of these ancient writs that is embodied, for example, in Magna Carta, that if someone is detained, arrested, they shouldn't be detained forever or for extended periods of time without charge. And in fact, one of the common moves of petty tyrants everywhere is to have people arrested and held indefinitely without charge, which means they never have to be brought to trial and their guilt never has to be proven. And habeas corpus means the court can order the person, the jailer, the executive, the king, holding the person prisoner to produce them in court and to provide reasons why they have been arrested and then to move forward towards actually having a lawful trial. So in the Five Knights case, a writ of habeas corpus was filed for, for five people who were arrested by Charles. The lawyer for the Five Knights was John Selden, who you see here on one side of your screen and Charles on the other side of your screen. And Selden's argument was that, according to Magna Carta, the law should take precedence over the king. You see our, our familiar theme. Um, but the court held that Based on precedent, on long history of precedent, the king's prerogatives should govern. And so that the king, if the king directly orders someone to be arrested, the writ of habeas corpus should not prevail. So again, the, the royal prerogative won in this situation in court, but the arguments that were made and the way the dispute developed is an important historical touchstone. So Charles goes on and, and is trying to raise money to support a military buildup that he is in, engaging in because of ongoing conflicts abroad. And when he can't get Parliament to support the revenue he wants to raise, he starts imposing forced loans on some of the aristocracy. And the aristocracy begins to refuse to pay some of those forced loans. The familiar theme, the king trying to impose taxes without popular support. Charles imposes martial law and imposes further requirements that uh, when the army is in town, people have to quarter them, in other words, keep them in their homes, have to feed them, have to house them. And you, you should begin to see now some practices that when you have read the Declaration of Independence, you can see the American colonists prote protesting against that were happen happening later in the American colonies. So Parliament uh, disagrees with what Charles is doing and refuses to ratify Charles's new taxes and his policies unless Charles would agree to something called the Petition of Right, which was crafted in 1628. And you can see in the Petition of Right themes about 
popular consent and about limits on the authority of the king. So taxes should not be levied without the assent of other portions of society, the buy-in of other portions of society, uh, and an affirmation in the petition of right of the principles of Magna Carta, uh, and including principles of not arresting someone without proper cause and bringing people to trial if they are actually arrested. So the petition of right is reluctantly agreed to by Charles, but not really up, upheld by Charles. And we see continued tension, and it's not only Charles, but the Anglican party also having tension with the Puritan party. And this is when some of the Puritans left England seeking asylum in Holland, and some of those Puritans who had sought asylum in Holland left for America on the Mayflower. So it is out of these disputes that we're talking about that those Puritans came to America on the Mayflower. And it is against this background that they bring some of the ideas that they bring that then later on filter into some of the ideas of the American founders. Well, there were some Puritans remaining in England, and the Puritans remaining in Parliament are trying to pass measures against the, the Anglican church hierarchy and trying to strip Charles of command of the armed forces. These tensions in England boil over into civil war. And the aristocratic supporters of Charles during this civil war are called the Cavaliers. And the Puritans and their supporters in Parliament were called the Roundheads. The Roundheads were led by Oliver Cromwell, a Puritan general, who crafted a, something called the New Model Army, so a new way of, of um, training, disciplining, and fighting an army, which was at the time very effective. And Cromwell's army prevails, so the Roundheads win over the Cavaliers. But a settlement or resolution is released, is reached after Cromwell's military victory that allows Charles to remain on the throne. That doesn't last. Conflicts persist, and a second civil war erupts. Cromwell and the Puritans prevail again, and as a result of all this, Charles was tried for treason, Charles was convicted, and Charles was beheaded on January 30th, 1649. So there are some important documents and events in the period leading up to Charles' execution that bear on our understanding of, of constitutional history. And one is the Ordinance for the Trial of the King, passed by the House of Commons in 1649. The House of Commons was more heavily influenced by the Puritan party. The House of Lords was more heavily influenced by the Anglican party, although there were parts of both in each house. The House, so you can see this, ordin this resolution, ordinance, passed by the House of Commons says that Charles had passed over from being a legitimate king to being a tyrant. This ordinance is rejected by the House of Lords, but then a joint committee of Lords and Commons, made up of people sympathetic to the Protestant party, passed the resolution. You can see here, actually, another theme that is something we want to keep an eye on throughout the semester, which is within the separation of powers, within the way the government is supposed to function, um, are there times when those, those ways it is supposed to function are, are potentially being sub subverted? And we have some excerpts from the actual trial. And, and in these excerpts, a really interesting back and forth between the presiding judge and King Charles. And Charles says, what is the authority? What is the lawful authority under which you are here try trying me? How are you any different than thieves and robbers on the highway? How is this any different than a mere exercise of violence? And the presiding judge in some ways really doesn't answer, but says, you should know the authority is in the name of the people of England. The authority comes from the people, and you are elected, although not really elected through votes, but chosen to answer to them. Now, the presiding judge really is kind of playing a little fast and loose with the facts here as to whether uh, 
these Puritan parts of the House of Commons and Lords really re represent the whole people, but it does illustrate the tension. After Charles's execution, in fact, the House of Lords for, for a period of time was actually abolished. So now we move into a period called the Interregnum. Charles is executed, what happens next? Charles had summoned a parliament called the Long Parliament, called that because it was in session for a relatively long period of time. The Long Parliament succeeded the Short Parliament, which was in session for a very short period of time. Cromwell has the members of parliament who had been disloyal to Cromwell purged from parliament. This is called, in, in 1648, and this is called Pride's Purge because it is named after Colonel Thomas Pride, and we see a, a, an engraving here of Pride standing in the doorway of Parliament, not allowing those disloyal parliamentarians, disloyal to Cromwell, to sit. The remaining members of Commons are called the Rump Parliament. Now, Rump, of course, can refer to the backside of an animal, and there's probably a double entendre there, but uh, it also means something truncated. So the Rump Parliament. The Rump Parliament actually passes legislation barring the office of king. And you can see that piece of legislation here on your screen. So in this period called the Interregnum, there's no king reigning. But Cromwell wasn't very happy with all of the developments. And there are many pieces to this history we could talk about. One of those pieces was that the kind of populist fervor of the Puritans, of which Cromwell himself was a part and of which Cromwell himself developed his army, began to spill further over into more radically populist groups, in particular a group called the Levelers. So the Levelers wanted not only to do away with the king, but to have the franchise, the voting franchise, apply to all citizens, including citizens who didn't own land. Now, the franchise, still in, in, in Cromwell's time, belongs to aristocrats, or people who are wealthy enough, at least, to, to own land. Uh, and one of the franchise extended even more broadly. And that movement is ultimately crushed by Cromwell. Cromwell is also dealing with rebellions in Ireland and in Scotland, which he defeats as well. And with his control over the army, Cromwell then closes down even the rump parliament. Notice another theme, and this is another theme that the, fa the framers and the founders of the American Republic found really troubling and important, which is the problem of a standing army and the ability of someone who has political power, who is in control of the army, to dictate the affairs of the country. Now, of course, today we do have a standing army. Uh, we would not want to have a standing army. Um, but whether to have a standing army and how large it should be and who should have control over it was a big issue for the framers. And this is one of the reasons why. So Cromwell closes down the rump parliament. He establishes a new parliament called the Bare Bones Parliament. And the Bare Bones Parliament is, was derisively named after this person, whose name was, praise God, Barebone. He was a Puritan member of that parliament. These were people, of course, that Cromwell thought would be loyal to him. He wasn't happy with that parliament e either, and he dissolved that parliament. So after dissolving the Bare Bones Parliament, Cromwell has himself declared Lord Protector of the Commonwealth. And of course, Cromwell's critics suggest this isn't really any different than a king. Cromwell begins to have difficulty collecting the taxes he needs to support the army, and he begins to bankrupt the treasury. Cromwell dies, and his son Richard inherits the title Lord Protector. But Richard doesn't have the same deep support in the army that his father Oliver had. And there are other people within the army, other officers, within the army who want to take power as well. Some of those include John Lambert and Charles Fleetwood, who are, were in many ways more radical politically 
than Oliver ever was. And these officers who have more support from the army force Richard to resign and they reinstate the rump parliament, thinking that they would be able to control members of the rump parliament who had been loyal to them. Meanwhile, another army officer, George Monk, was with the army in Scotland and had a great deal of loyalty from those portions of the army. He doesn't like what Lambert and Fleetwood are doing. He returns to London and marches into London with his army, gets rid of Lambert and Fleetwood, calls a new parliament, and then invites Charles II, Charles I's son, Charles II, to return to the throne. And this period is called the restoration of the monarchy. There is some important political philosophy from this period of interregnum and then the restoration, which contains some similar themes and some contrasting themes, all of which filter into the thought of the American founders and all of which relate to our concepts of constitutional government. And the first one we'll look at is John Milton's Tenure of Kings and Magistrates, published in 1649. You might know Milton from Paradise Lost, his very famous epic, but Milton was also a political philosopher, and Milton was a Puritan. So you can see some of those Puritan themes in Milton's thought. Everyone, he says, and he says, uh, no one could be so stupid as to deny that all men are naturally born free because they're born in the image and likeness of God. And all men, every man, is bo born to command and not, not to obey. Now, something I want you to notice here, particularly in these political philosophers that we're going to be talking about here, Milton and Hobbes and Locke, but you can see it also in Aristotle and in Plato and in the, in the Judaic and the Christian philosophies we, we talked about earlier, is that there's always a concept of what is the state of nature? What is the original state of human beings, in a sense, before political society. And that has a significant impact on how that thinker is going to consider what political society actually is meant to do. And so notice that Milton's view of, political, of the original state of humans is that they're born free and they're born to command and not to obey. But he says, they recognize that they have to work together if they don't work together, they're going to find their security disturbed. And because they need to work together, they have to come to some kind of agreement. And that agreement creates cities and towns and commonwealths. And those cities and towns and commonwealths have to be governed. And they're either going to be governed by kings or magistrates. And by magistrates, he means other qualified rulers. And those kings or magistrates are going to be selected by the people for their particular virtues, their abilities to govern. Notice some of the connections here to the Platonic and Aristotelian ideas of what the proper kind of governor would be. But, Milton says, the power of a king or magistrate has to be constrained. It can't be just an arbitrary exercise of power. And this is particularly true because every human being although born free, is imperfect and subject to errors and failures. And this very much resonates with Milton's puritanical, Puritan conception of the sinfulness, the fallenness of all human beings. And the power of the king and magistrate is only derivative of the common good from the people, and therefore a king or magistrate only rightfully exercises their power of authority on behalf of the common good, on behalf of the people. And notice that theme of the commonwealth, of the republic, res publica, being a gathered society sharing the things they love, as August, uh, Augustine said. And Milton can, says that it, to say that a king is accountable to none but God, which, remember, is what James had said, is the overturning of 
of all law and government. So we have these themes from Milton. We want to con compare that a little bit to Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes. And Thomas Hobbes is a supporter of the Restoration. And look at Hobbes's idea in, in his uh, text Leviathan, published in 1651. Look at Hobbes's idea of the state of nature. In the state of nature, when there's no political society, people live in a state of war, that is, in a state of violence. It is every man against every man. Very much a contrast to Milton's idea that all people are, are born free. There's a sense of being born free in Hobbes, but it's a freedom that is only preserved individually by violence. Uh, and Hobbes says it's not even wrong or sinful to be violent in these circumstances because this is simply the way people are made. It's simply what we mean. And Hobbes has this famous quote that you may have heard, that the state of nature is, a, is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Given that, Hobbes said, people should want peace. I mean, that solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short is not a good way to live. It's, it's a way to have your life cut short, as Hobbes said. So men ought to try to get peace and should and may try to get peace through exercising war. And that includes, Hobbes said, a right of self-defense. But it isn't good, Hobbes said, for everyone in their own right of self-defense to simply be fighting against each other all the time. And that means that each individual has to give up some measure of their natural liberty in exchange for peace. Notice for Hobbes, this is a kind of contractual exchange. This is what we call the social contract. So where we see in Milton kind of more of a um, covenantal idea of the king or the magistrate or the other, each person being born free, the political leader deriving authority from the people and having a uh, kind of moral relationship, a covenantal relationship to the good of the commonweal. In Hobbes, we see each individual being violent against each other and a contractual relationship between individuals. And it's simply a matter of, of pragmatic consent. Uh, Hobbes does say people ought to keep their covenants. This is a moral rule for Hobbes that people ought to keep their covenants, and they ought to do that in order that the social compact would hold together and would preserve peace. So when we talk in modern constitutional law and theory about the Constitution being in the nature of a social contract, we're invoking terms from, from Hobbes. Hobbes says that a, uh, a covenant cannot be made or defended without some power to help support it. That is a commonwealth. And Hobbes believed that a commonwealth cannot exist unless the social contract, the agreement, among the people is to transfer authority in that commonwealth to one will. So all of this plurality of individual wills is going to be fighting against amongst each other all the time. They can agree to make peace through a social arrangement, and that social arrangement, if it's going to hold, Hobbes said, must include an agreement to give authority to one person. So Hobbes is upholding the need for a king, but it is a sovereign, a king, which is derived out of, for Hobbes, out of a social contract. So you might say, well, Hobbes sounds a lot like James giving his speech before Parliament, or sounds a lot like Charles giving his defense before the bench. But Hobbes qualifies this by saying that there are some natural liberties, some natural rights that people have that the law cannot constrain. In other words, that even the sovereign, even the king cannot override. And it could not even be lawful if a person wanted to, to transfer those things to the king. And these include some of the things that we would think of as civil rights and that we can see tracing back to Magna Carta right not to testify against oneself, right not to harm oneself, uh, 
those sort of individual protections against the exercise of power. So the idea of some kind of transfer of sovereignty, but of some inherent rights that are to be preserved and can't be transferred, we can see also in Hobbes, even though Hobbes is a supporter of the Restoration. That tension that we see in Hobbes between what is transferred to the sovereign and what is inherently retained by the individual continues to play out in the ongoing history of England in these periods. So we see Charles II, who has been restored to the throne, even with being restored, continues to have disputes with Parliament about taxation, and also about the toleration of non-Anglican dissenters. The Anglican party wants the Church of England, the established English church, to be Anglican, not to be Roman Catholic, and also not to practice or allow even the practices of other Protestant sects that are be beginning to become more prominent in this period, including Baptists, who derive from the Anabaptists and radical reformers at the time of the Reformation, and Quakers who are kind of taking another step in the direction of the radical Reformation towards a more individual kind of piety. Uh, and so these disputes continue to boil over, and then there's a further dispute about who is going to succeed Charles to the, to, to the throne, because the person that seems to be in the line of succession is Charles' brother James, and James is openly Catholic. It sounds bizarre to say something like openly Catholic, but to be Catholic was fraught in England at this time. And the Anglican party, although it didn't want to tolerate the Baptists and Quakers, it didn't want to tolerate the Catholics either. Charles does die in 1685, and he is succeeded by his brother James, and this spills over into revolution. By the way, another theme that you can see in all of these periods of history and that we can see throughout world history is the difficulty of peaceful succession, peaceful transfer of power. And one of the pieces of our constitutional order that the founders and the framers talked about and that even developed further in subsequent American history was the question of how to ensure a peaceful transition of power when a different political party and a different president takes over. Uh, so we see here a uh, transition to James, a revolt led by some of the other elites, uh, and that revolt is crushed. Many uh, supporters of the party that revolted, as well as some uh, low church Protestant peasants are executed, and James then retains the army that defeated the Duke of Monmouth, who was the party leading the revolt. So you have to imagine in this period that uh, there's not an army that's just kind of sitting around waiting to be used. If there is a war or dispute, then the crown is raising the army. And then the, the notion is when that war or dispute is over, the army disperses. But James retains this standing army. And that standing army, it so happens, many of the leadership in that army are Catholics. So this is causing problems with the uh, ongoing problems with the aristocracy, even though that revolt is put down, the unrest continues. So James retains the standing army, and then he takes other measures that cause great concern among some of his, imp uh, some of his opponents, particularly among the Anglican elites. James wants to repeal the Test Act. The Test Act was a statute that required people who wanted to hold certain offices to take an oath attesting to their Anglican orthodoxy, an oath that someone who's Roman Catholic or Baptist or Quaker wouldn't be able to pass. And the Anglican elites in Parliament did not approve of that. James also wanted to pass a declaration of indulgence which would allow religious dissenters to have the free exercise of their religion. And again, and, and James required the Anglican clergy to actually read this Declaration of Indulgence from their pulpits, and this was resisted. So these Anglican elites and their aristocratic supporters 
then invited William of Orange and his wife Mary, who was James's daughter, to come to England and to take the throne. James, perceiving that he did not have the support of the military and the ability to resist this, fled England, and William and Mary indeed took the throne in 1689 in a bloodless revolution called by its supporters the Glorious Revolution. Now, those elites that wanted the Glorious Revolution to happen did not want to get rid of the Test Act, did not want this Declaration of Indulgence, but they were concerned about preserving some of their own rights, in particular in relation to the power of the king. And so in 1689, we see the English Bill of Rights. And you, you would be correct to see in this as a precursor, an example of a Bill of Rights that would later be taken up in the Bill of Rights to the US Constitution, which we will talk about in class. So the English Bill of Rights talks about the problems of suspending laws without the consent of parliament, of taxation without the consent of parliament, of standing armies, excessive bail, excessive fines, cruel and unusual punishments. You should recognize all these themes from the Declaration of Independence and you will see them all in the American Bill of Rights. And it grants certain rights over against the prerogatives, the power of the king. In and around this period, we're going to look at our third really important political theorist who had a huge influence on the American founders and the, and the framers of the 1789 Constitution, and that is John Locke. And John Locke writes his second treatise on government in 1690. Now, of course, Locke wrote much more than this. There are other important philosophers of this era that we could talk about, but we're going to just try and focus on, on a few to keep this manageable for us. So what is Locke's idea of the state of nature? Remember, Mil Milton said there, that each person is, is born free. Remember that Hobbes said it is uh, solitary, short, nasty, brutish, and there's a perpetual state of war. Locke says the state of nature is a state of perfect freedom and equality. So in some ways, he's echoing some themes of Milton, but he's also adding on these elements of equality. And he also talks about the natural law in a different way than someone like Milton would have exactly talked about it, because he's talking about it in a much more rationalistic way. The law of nature, the natural law, Locke effectively is saying, is reason. And reason is what tells us that each person is equal, that no one should harm somebody else or damage their life, health, liberty, or possessions without some kind of just reason. Now, notice those words. And they certainly resonate with life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness in, for example, the Declaration of Independence. If someone violates this law, what Locke thought of as this law of reason, anyone who violates that law, the community has a power to restrain that person. And that's a necessary power because it is going to happen sometimes that someone is going to do violence to somebody else's right to be protected in their life, health, liberty, or possessions. But Locke said we don't want that power of restraint to be exercised only by individuals because that then leads to arbitrary violence and mistakes. And so that needs to be, Locke said, a corporate, a social power. And it is for this reason, Locke said, that people, by reason, join together and unite together in a commonwealth and put themselves under a common government so that the necessary exercise of this power of restraint is not just one individual's arbitrary will, but is exercised collectively or together 
in, in accordance with reason. Now, an important thing to notice about Locke's conception of the political community and the role of the political community that differs in some ways from Milton and from Hobbes, and that is really a stronger emphasis than you had seen in thinkers in preceding Locke, has to do with the right of private property. So the great and chief end of men's uniting into commonwealths, Locke said, is to preserve their property. And Locke had an elaborate theory of how individual property rights arise. And it's, it's called Locke's labor theory. And the idea is that land property exists in the state of nature and is undeveloped. And by applying labor to it, human beings then acquire a natural right to the fruits of that labor. And these ideas about property, about the role of government relating to property, also, we can see in some ways, were important to the framers. As you might gather then, Locke did not approve of absolute monarchy. He contrasts, he's contrasted to Hobbes in this sense, where Hobbes thought that for the commonwealth to function, the social contract had to be a strong agreement to a strong monarch. Locke thought that the agreement could be more governed by reason, and that reason actually opposes an absolute monarch. Locke also has some notions that you can see as a kind of separation of powers. Locke views the legislative as the first and most important power. It is through the legislative power that the common wealth, the common body, through reason, creates the laws that are governing the community. And the role of the executive is to enforce that legislation. He also conceived of what he called a federative power, which is really a power of acting internationally. So acting on behalf of the Commonwealth internationally. Notice that Locke doesn't have a developed theory of judicial power. Now, one thing I hope you notice between some of these, this kind of covenantal view of Milton, this social contract pragmatist view of Hobbes, this rationalistic natural law view with a heavy emphasis on uh, property, individual property of Locke, different, subtly different concepts of what the Commonwealth is and what governance is supposed to do that are still with us today and still matters of different emphasis in trying to understand what the founding documents, what the Constitution actually does, what it actually sets up and how it actually should be interpreted, including even the question of what is the role of judiciary in relation to the role of legislative power. Now, we have spent a bunch of time talking about developments in England. And as we said at the outset of this video, we spent a lot of time talking about England because we're talking about the origins of American constitutionalism, which as a colony of England and as developing out of the American Revolution from being a colony in England are heavily influenced by English history and English ideas. But I don't want to leave you with the concept that it's only English ideas that influenced the founders and, and the framers and in, continue to influence our concept of constitutionalism because there were other important ideas in continental Europe. And I just want to highlight a moment some developments in France. In the eight, by the 18th century, the population of France is growing rapidly. The economy of France is not doing well. There's widespread unemployment. There's civil unrest. There's constant ongoing war, including wars with England. There's a state of debt. There are high taxes. And this leads to a crisis of what's called the ancient regime. And the ancient regime is a, an even more monarchist tradition 
and an even more Catholic tradition in France, then subsequently developed in England. So we see some theorists like Montesquieu writing his text, The Spirit of the Laws, in 1748, and beginning to question the ancient regime and asking what comes next. And notice how Montesquieu is playing off categories that we have seen at least since Aristotle. So what are, what are political systems that could exist? He says a republican, a monarchical system, or a despotic system. A republic, he says, can be democratic or aristocratic. A monarch is only, monarchical system is only not despotic if it's governed by the rule of law. And we have seen these themes before. And in particular, Montesquieu develops more clearly a concept of the separation of powers that we would recognize in our American constitutional order and that indeed influenced our American constitutional order. So there's a legislative power, there is an executive power, and there is a judicial power, and there's authority assigned to each of those bodies. And Montesquieu also emphasized individual liberties, including due process, and in contrast to what we saw in England, freedom of thought, freedom of speech, assembly. Well, for some of those ideas, Montesquieu's books were put on the banned book list by the Catholic Church in France at the time, but you can see how they had some significant influence on the American founding documents. And of course, it's now, at this point in history, we're into the mid-18th century, that we could begin to talk about the American founding documents. I'm not going to do that in this video. I assigned those to you to read and to write your reflection papers on. And I hope now that you can see how some of those documents are in a deeper historical context and how the things we debate even today about those documents, the, the relationship of the different branches of, of government, how much power to give the executive, in which way the executive is restrained by the rule of law, the nature of individual rights in relation to the structure of governance, the, re the relation of the overall scheme of polity and governance to some kind of higher principles, whether you want to call those principles natural law or something else. All of these kinds of themes uh, are deep in the Western history. And they're, and they're deep and contested, and they have been contested not only in our present history, but in past history. And we can highlight this right now in just two ways. One is the French Revolution. So although you have theorists like Montesquieu, his books are banned, but the, the fervor continues. And if you know something about the French Revolution, which occurs after the American Revolution, you know that it really goes awry, and it leads to what was called the Reign of Terror, in which there really were arbitrary executions by guillotine of many of the French elite, and in which really devolved into forms of violence, and which eventually led to the subsequent authoritarian rule of Napoleon Bonaparte. And then we'd have to go into later French history to see how French eventually became a, a kind of constitutional republic. And we can also say, meanwhile, in the United States. Now, as we know, as I, as I mentioned in my initial email giving you the assignment to look at the American founding documents, the American founding documents didn't resolve the deepest problem of our history, which is the problem of slavery and the related problem of racism. There were some uneasy compromises, there was some punting, there were some things that allowed slavery to continue. And that cancer, of course, led to the American Civil War. So our, our founding didn't last as long as we would have liked it to before violence either. And it didn't last as long as we would have liked it to before violence because it didn't 
really address this problem, this cancer of slavery and race. And part of what will, an important part of what we'll discuss uh, in the civil rights portion of our constitutional law class during the semester will be the amendments to the Constitution after the Civil War, uh, and then the Jim Crow era, and then the Civil Rights Movement, and how all of those questions continue to play out. So let me sum up this video with some themes. As I see it, this deep history that I've, I've been trying to convey to you has some positive themes that I, that I hope you can take away and that I hope stick with you. One is the importance of the rule of law over the rule of any one person or any one group of people. Another is that positive law, human-made law, connects to some higher principle. You might think that principle derives from God. If you're a religious person, you might think it derives from something in human nature or from reason. But the idea that positive law connects to some higher principle, an idea that is even aside from the question of, of God, is contested in our time. The idea that a commonwealth, a true commonwealth, is based on some kind of consent, on something that the people share. As Augustine said, the common object of their, their loves or, or passions. And hopefully that's a passion for justice, a passion for peace, a pa passion for human flourishing. The rights of individuals, of individuals against arbitrary government power in documents that were early forms of bills of rights and that are part of the Bill of Rights to our Constitution. At the same time, restraints on the popular will. It is right to say in a republic, in a commonwealth, there is a tension with absolute democracy. So how does that tension with absolute de democracy restraining mob rule, and in particular, protecting the rights of minority groups who are, who are not part of the majority that we think are important to protect notwithstanding what might be the will of the majority and how you balance that out. The relationship of different groups within the constitutional order and the separation of, of powers within the government, the role of and control over the military, and in particular, the relationship between the military and the executive. And then, I hope you also see the fragility of this whole thing. It is not inevitable. In fact, the arc of history uh, suggests a tendency to power grabs and violence. Now, I happen to, to agree with Martin Luther King Jr. that the true arc of history bends toward justice. And that, that's what Martin Luther King Jr. said in his letter from the Birmingham jail. But the lived arc of history is always pushing against this problem of violence and, and assertions of power. Now, let me also note some things that this video left out. We didn't really talk at all about the European civil law tradition. I think in a broader discussion of the rule of law and of forms of constitutional governments, it would really be important to, dis to discuss that. We only briefly touched on the developments in France, and there's a lot more we, we could have talked about, and if you take international law courses, you'll see how some of those things uh, filter in to international law. We didn't talk at all about non-Western legal systems, and, and that's not because I think those are unimportant. Uh, it's just because we are studying American constitutional law, and this video is about the backgrounds of American constitutionalism. Certainly there's a lot that we could learn from other legal systems. We didn't talk about international or transnational law. And again, that is an incredibly important overlay. And if you take international law courses, you'll, you'll learn more about that. I mentioned a number of times in this video 
the the historical connection between positive human you know human made law and higher principles and including in the tradition at least references to the gods or a god and i and i mentioned that we now live in different times and so what does that mean if you are a religious person as i am what does that mean how how do you live in a pluralistic world and articulate those higher principles in that context or if you're not a religious person what does that mean for you what are the what are the principles that you think law relates to or if you want to argue as many do today that the notion of of higher principles is really more often than not just rhetoric that people use to preserve their power um then what are you going to do with that how are you going to bring that back into some kind of concept of the rule of law that isn't merely an exercise in arbitrary power we touched only briefly on slavery we will talk about the cancer of slavery in more detail as we go through various parts of the class throughout the semester and in particular as we talk about the civil rights parts of the class but i don't want to leave you with the impression that i think the american constitutional order was perfect at its founding it wasn't it 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 had some amazing points of excellence and it's in a deep i think rich tradition but it had this cancer of slavery that it didn't solve and this cancer of race and including with that the treatment of indigenous peoples which we can't miss and if we talk about for example locke's labor theory of property and locke's emphasis on property rights and you consider people being influenced by some of those theories coming to the americas and you know making deals sham deals with the indigenous people and claiming property rights based on ideas from Locke or other ideas that that simply weren't the no, the concepts that those indigenous people had it raises some incredibly hard and difficult question not to mention the treatment of an indigenous people throughout american history and so we didn't deal with that but that's a legacy that we have to continue to deal with we haven't really talked much about class now i talked a little bit about class as we went through some of this history and saw you know the aristocratic classes asserting rights against the monarchy and then in the interregnum period the question of the puritans and some of their kind of ambiguous relationship but through all of these periods the common person didn't have the franchise didn't have the right to vote uh and how that continues to play out we have also not really touched on gender now you saw that some of the players in some of this history were powerful women in english history like like elizabeth the 1st but women didn't have the franchise women didn't have the voice women weren't seen as equal participants in the common wheel to men and in fact even in our american history uh that didn't happen until later in the 20th century by constitutional amendment and that's an important theme that we haven't talked about so we shouldn't leave with the impression that this is an uncritical treatment of this history and we we ought to be critical of this history in a proper intellectual sense asking questions and asking questions from the perspective of dispossessed people disenfranchised people uh slavery race class gender sexual orientation and so on through our history but i still think that some of these broad themes that we have mentioned ought to inform those discussions or at least ought to be part of the discussion that we have So I hope you've gotten something out of this and enjoyed it and I look forward to digging into the details 
of American constitutional law with you when we meet in class.